Hi, I'm Ross Jeffries, and I want to welcome you to Getting Up to Speed with Speed Seduction. What you're about to watch is Module 1 of a multi-module online course to bring you up to speed with Speed Seduction. Whether you're a newbie, someone who's curious about Speed Seduction but has never actually explored the technology and the tools, whether you're a longtime student and just want a refresher, I want to welcome you to this course. This course is going to be packed with information. Just a couple of administrative notes. It's not my job as a teacher, I don't think, to read from the slides. The slides that you're looking at that you're going to be seeing as you go through this course with me are designed for you to review, to look at at your leisure. They're not really <clears throat> something for me to narrate from. So a lot of this is going to be me talking about things that may not exactly replicate on the slides. Sometimes it will. But I want to point out to you, it's my job to reach across through the computer and to teach. Another thing I want you to see is if you'll look, you'll see the copyright notice gives you explicit and express permission to reproduce this course and post it anywhere. You can put it on your blog, you can put it on your website, share it on StumbleUpon, Facebook, I don't care. But please leave all the contact content intact. Don't change anything, don't subtract anything, don't add anything, and leave all the links intact. All right, here we go with Module 1. This is going to be really good. It's very important. It's about the concepts and the cognitions, the understandings. It really makes speed seduction a very powerful way, not just to um, have success with women, but relate to people in the world. So let's get to the concept of speed seduction. Well, first and foremost, speed seduction is about a set of concepts, a set of beliefs. It's a way of looking at women. It's a way of directing your attention to notice things that most people ignore completely. And we also want to teach you to ignore the things that the average frustrated chump focuses in on. So in speed seduction, we get very curious. We ask, how do women create their emotions? When a woman says she's attracted to a man, how does she experience that attraction? In what way does that take place inside of her body? What are the processes through which women create and build and experience their subjective internal world? How do they create what's going on in between the ears? Because you see, if you can understand and shape what goes on between the ears, then opening up and getting what's between the legs becomes relatively easy. So one of the key things we say in speed seduction, there probably should be quotation marks in, in that little thing, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as love. There's no such thing as fascination. There's no such thing as attraction. There's no such thing as desire. Now, I know for some of you watching this, you're saying, well, Ross, that's the problem. For me, there is no such thing. But what I mean is that what our language thinkifies, what our language takes and freezes into a thing that we either have or get inflicted upon us is not a thing. It's a process. It's something that takes place in the human brain, in the human mind, in the human physiology, in the human neurology. Because it's something that's flowing, that's moving, that means it has a structure. It has a syntax, and by syntax I mean it has a certain order. It has to be expressed in a certain order, and there's a flow to it. And granted that it's moving, granted that it has a structure, granted that it has a syntax, granted that it has a flow, anything that moves and flows can be interrupted, it can be amplified, it can be stopped, it can be started, it can be rearranged, it can be channeled, it can be controlled, it can be shaped. Now this is really a profound understanding. It's a very Zen understanding. You might say in some sense speed seduction is a very Zen way to seduce women because like Zen, we view women not as fixed things but as an ongoing changing process that's constantly moving, constantly changing. I got this idea and way of looking at the world through my study of NLP. NLP is the study of the subjective human experience, what goes on in between the ears and in the body. And when you begin to look at people and the things that people do, not as things, but in fact processes and ongoing activities, the edges of your limitations begin to get a little loose. The boundaries start to melt and things start to become possible. So here are the things I want you to ask. How do women create their emotions? Let's say a woman says, I'm really attracted to Bob. Well, how is that woman experiencing the attraction? Well, I want to suggest that any emotion that a woman experiences is the result of certain elements, certain components that you can rearrange in different orders, different proportions. First of all, she's got to have some kind of visual imagery. If she's attracted to Bob, somewhere in her mind she's making images of Bob 
Maybe she's making images of she and Bob getting it on. Maybe she's has an image in her mind of Bob looking real good. I don't know, but there's some visual component going on. Second, there's some kind of auditory dialogue. Whether it's in or outside of her conscious awareness, she's probably most likely saying something like, damn, Bob looks hot. Okay, I don't know what the content is, but there's probably almost certainly some auditory dialogue, something she's saying to herself in her head. She may even say it out loud when she thinks about it. Um, so that's the next component. She may be saying something out loud, like not just in her head, but damn, I want him. Hmm? There's obviously a flow of internal sensations. When she says she's attracted to Bob, that's really shorthand. It's shorthand for saying that as I'm thinking about Bob, I feel a rush of warmth in my chest that spreads to my shoulders. Then that warmth gets more intense and then the warmth spreads downward into my crotch. Or it could be shorthand for her saying, I feel a tingling up my spine. Then I feel warmth flush through my face. Then I feel the warmth rush into my vagina. When she says, I feel attracted to Bob, well, attracted really doesn't give any kind of description. It's shorthand for the actual physical flow of sensations in the body. See? So what's useful uh, as a way of demystifying female emotion, indeed all emotion, but one of the things I want to do is take the mystery out of this to demystify things that are deliberately mystified by society to keep you confused, to keep you a slave. Just like the movie The Matrix. I want to show you The Matrix. So let's think of recipes. When you think of a recipe, let's think of baking a cake, baking a pie, baking cookies. What makes up a recipe? What's in the recipe? Well, first of all, there's ingredients, right? Think about it. What are the ingredients for a cake? There's the cake mix, there's flour, sugar, eggs, water, you know, whatever goes into it. Then there are the actions that you have to take. You have to do certain things. You have to pour in the sugar. You have to mix the flour. You have to crack in the eggs. You have to stick it into the oven. So they're the actions that you have to take. Then there's the proper sequence, right? When you bake a cake or watch someone else bake a cake, they have to do it in the right sequence. You don't mix everything in, stick it in the oven, and after 45 minutes, then you crack in the eggs. That doesn't work. So you have to do things in the proper sequence. Then you have to have the proper proportions. If you're making a cake to feed four or five people, you're obviously not going to, you know, crack in 15 dozen eggs. That would be too much. So you have to have all these things. You have to have the right ingredients. You have to take the right actions in the right sequence with the right proportion of ingredients. That's a recipe. So where am I driving with this? You can do the emotions that you want a woman to experience with you as the nothing more than the combination of different elements of a recipe taking place in a certain sequence with a certain proportion. That's it. There's nothing mysterious about it. A woman's emotions don't come because some chemical floats into her brain. I won't get into argument about pheromones. Or because a little mysterious angel called Cupid shoots an arrow in her ass. Or because she's met her soulmate or any of that twaddle. It happens as the result of a sequence with a proportion with ingredients. Okay? So, we want to ask different questions. We want to ask the speed seducers, what emotional states do I want attractive women to experience with me? Let's talk about this. One of the fatal mistakes most men make with women is they're so focused on behavior. They ask things like, how can I get Debbie to go out with me? Assuming that going out with you is going to be useful. How can I get Debbie to sleep with me? How can I get Debbie to have a threesome with me and her twin sister? You're over-focused on behavior. Now, of course, we have to keep behavior in mind, but the real deal with women is we ought to first ask, no, no. What are the emotional states I want Debbie to be around? to be in when she's around me, when she's thinking about me, such that those behaviors will normally just flow out of those emotional states, right? When women are in certain emotional states, they're far more likely to eagerly give us those behaviors that we're seeking. So back up a minute from the behaviors, and if you think about some woman who you really want to get with, instead of asking, how can I get her to do this, which is okay at some point in your sequence, first ask, okay, what are the emotional states I want her to associate with me? When I ask this question in my seminars, students raise their hands and say, lust, dripping arousal, super hot desire. So, you know, they're really leaning on it. Those are all good things. See, the thing is this, is if, if you're a nice guy, part of the problem is the only emotional states a woman experiences around you are casual comfort and some mild enjoyment, maybe even some boredom. And the key here is emotional states. So if she only experiences casual comfort, you know, casual enjoyment, 
that sort of thing, you're just going to wind up being her friend, her big brother, maybe even her therapist, which is the worst thing of all. On the other side of the cover, if she only experiences lust or arousal or desire, she may scare herself out of the seduction. Problem with the nice guy is he only gets the dull states. Problem with the seducer, the, the player, not the seducer, problem with the player is the player only gets these wild, crazy states, and unless you can get her to act on it right then and there, he's going to get buyer's remorse. So we want to learn to create a balance of states, that unique combination of, in the recipe that's going to get her to open up her legs and be happy she did it and open up her heart and everything else too. Speed seducers ask different questions. Let me just say that the kinds of questions you ask will structure the kind of thinking you can do, how far you can think about a subject, how you think about a subject, and that in turn will determine the behavioral choices you have. So you really need to watch the questions that you ask yourself. Some of the biggest breakthroughs in human thought, in human science, human progress have happened because people asked different questions. People took the common assumptions and said, what if they're not true? Just as a little digression, Albert Einstein, when he created his theory of relativity, the, the common assumption back then is that there were no infinite, there were no infinite speeds. Uh, that there, strike that, there were no finite speeds, that you could just keep accelerating and accelerating, that there were fixed frames of reference, that space was like a blank fixed canvas against which all activity took place. And Einstein said, wait a minute, what if that's not true? What if there are no fixed frames of reference? And what if there is a finite speed in the universe and that's the speed of light? And everything else came from that. So I want you to begin to ask a different set of questions about women. And by the way, as you do this, you will begin to see the old questions that really kept you stuck. <coughs> excuse me. It's common for <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm a real person. This is not some slick recording studio. As you can see, I'm just speaking my truth from the heart, telling you what I really think. It's common to get pissed off when you first learn this, to see how brainwashed you are, to see how you've been held down, how you've been fooled and tricked, and I understand that. So put the anger aside if it comes up and just ask, you know, learn to ask different questions. Ask the questions that empower you, that open up possibility. So chumps versus champs. There's a, there's a phrase, if you're familiar with the seduction community, called AFC, Average Frustrated Chump, which I coined all the way back in 1988 when I wrote my first book. How to Get the Women You Desire in the Bed, A Down and Dirty Guide to Dating and Seduction for the Man Who's Fed Up with Being Mr. Nice Guy. The AFC is just the average frustrated chump. He's the guy who's been programmed without question, like a good soldier, to think in terms of the dating game, the dating frame. He's the guy who asks himself, how can I ask her out? How can I get her to go out with me? Where should I take her? When do I make my move? What if she doesn't like me? How, how can I get lucky? What if I get lucky? Will I get lucky? As you can see, these are all kinds of questions that presuppose a lot of things that are really not useful. The chump's questions imply certain things, and let's go through these line by line, item by item. And as I do so, as you think about this and identify through your own experience how you see the truth of it, I, I want you to really get this. First and foremost, the chump's questions assumes that he should focus first on behavior, that it's about what he does and what he gets her to do, rather than the emotions he wishes to create. So right then and there, out of the gate, he's cutting himself off from the key, most important understanding that he could possibly have, and the most important tool, his point of leverage into that woman's experience. Right out of the gate, he's dropping his sword before he even enters into the battle. Another assumption, that a date some kind of formal meeting where some third party is going to provide entertainment or food or gifts or inter, you know some kind of distraction. That's the best or even the only method to find a suitable female sex partner. Well, you may think, well, of course, what else is there? Well, there's a lot else. But you see, when you've been programmed to only think of those terms, then you're, you're just going to screw up. The, another assumption, <laughs> another something that the Trump's questions imply, imply or assume is that he has to be the supplicant. He has to seek the woman's favor. He has to ask her out. He has to worry about whether she's going to reject him. He has to worry about how he has to win her over. And also, and this one really bugs me, that the outcome is largely a matter of chance. Um, will he get lucky? Right? Uh, uh, or will he get some? Where's, uh, where's the implication there that you have any choice or any control or any real 
predictable input into the outcome. You see? I once used this, I often have used this illustration. If you were getting on a plane, say from uh, New York to Italy or uh, Israel to China, and as you were getting on the plane, you, uh, you leaned into the cockpit and you said to the pilot, how are you going to make sure we get to China? And he looked at you, and he honestly met me. He said, I don't know, maybe we'll get lucky. Or we'll try something. Well, I'll make my move once I'm halfway there. You get off the plane. I want to suggest to you that your love life and, and all the ego issues related to sex and being attractive, it's at least as important as flying you know, the friendly skies. So if you felt like a loser in the dating game, nice, lovely illustration, it was never designed for you to win. It's not designed for you to win. Now, maybe if you're good looking and you're high status and you're famous or rich, if you're a movie star, people say to me, well, what about um, Brad Pitt? Brad Pitt seems like such a nice guy. Brad Pitt doesn't. Well, Brad Pitt, listen, if I was Ross Jeffries, the incredibly good looking, internationally famous, fabulously wealthy movie star, okay, I could act differently and do different things and think a different way and be really successful with women. I'm assuming if you're watching this, you're not Brad Pitt or someone of that status. Although you would be surprised how when guys don't know how to exert the right kind of influence and control, even they get burned. The, the, the stories of very powerful, wealthy men, movie stars, captains of industry, famous politicians who can't control it in the bedroom and get brought down by women. Those stories are, are, are too numerous to, to relate. I don't think you need me to tell you that. So I, I want you to notice that in any kind of social mechanism where lots of people are losing, you need to look for where the money is going. So who benefits from the dating game? Well, Women get lots of free meals, but the entertainment industry, the restaurant industry, the flower industry, the gift industry, God help you if you're really a loser, the diamond industry, it goes on and on and on and on. Yes? So here's a key speed seduction rule. One of the things I think you ought to do is you, you should take these rules and you should write them down on flashcards. I don't know. I don't have any flashcards here in my little home studio, but you know, little five and a half by whatever cards. And keep them by your bedside and go through them every freaking night. Tattoo them on the inside of your eyelids because these are crucial. Successfully attracting and seducing women. Six, really having choice, true choice, where you never have to worry about whether she's going to like you the next day. You can just move on if she's not pleasing you. Having that kind of choice is crucial. There's something crucial to get that. And that is how can you capture and lead her imagination and emotions? That's it. What can you do? How do you structure your communication to capture and lead their imagination and emotions? It's a question I drill into my students' heads. How is this communication designed to capture and lead a woman's imagination and emotions? Now, I have to say, this is not really new with me. Seducers, Lotharios, Casanovas, Don Juans have been doing this across the ages. They've been using their words to capture and lead a woman's imagination and emotions. When you can learn to do this predictably, reliably, with milestones, so you can see where you are in the process, what you need to do next, where you need to back up, where you need to drive forward, where you maybe need to take a left or a right turn. When you can learn to do this, then dating will be for women who you're already sleeping with. I encourage my students to chant that. Dating is for women I'm already sleeping with. Now here's the cool, really cool thing. You don't need a formal date to do this. You don't need a formal date to do this. And in fact, a date may just get in the way. And the reason why a date may get in the way is the minute you ask a woman on a date, her checklist pops up. I may discuss this in a subsequent module, the module after this one, but women have a checklist, like an automatic checklist in her head of the things that society has programmed her to look for and the things she's used to looking for, her habitual, what she's used to liking or not liking. And that's all cool, that's all fine, but as soon as you ask for a date, that checklist pops up because she's going to measure you against that checklist to see if you potentially fit in. See, so we want to, as far as possible, actually avoid dates. Now, get this, it's never about where you take her or what you spend. I'll say it again, it's never, 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 never about where you take her or what you spend. I have gotten with women, and you look at my face, I am not a good looking guy, well I'm okay. But I've gotten with some of those amazing women within 20 to 30 minutes of talking to them. And, you know, these are some high-class girls, too. And I, I, I've done it without spending more than five bucks. Um, 
So it's never about where you take her or where you spend or what you spend. It's about how you use your language and how you can get her talking. What can you get her talking about to capture and lead her imagination and emotions? And you know, if she's feeling hot, if she's feeling turned on, if she's feeling connected, if she's feeling ready, then you could be in a bar room, a back alley, a bathroom, a barn. Pick your favorite B. You don't need a bedroom. This is the reality of how things work. So let me recommend uh, a product here. The recommended product is my Speed Seduction Home Study course. You can see the URL here. It's www.speedseduction.biz slash products slash RJ, that's capital R, capital J, 187.php. Let me talk uh, a little bit more here in this module because I'm just thinking about a few things I want to add before we conclude it and I get on to recording the next module. One of the things I, I want you to understand is that women are not usually consciously aware of how they create their emotions. For the most part, all, thing, all that women are consciously aware of is some feeling in their body. They are not consciously aware of the other elements of the recipe. So when you get really good at this, you can actually see those elements cooking. You can almost see what they're thinking in their head. You can almost hear the internal dialogue. You can watch this stuff being generated. But the really cool thing is this. Because women are not consciously aware of most of the process, it operates in a very hypnotic way. What I mean by that is that anything that takes place outside of a person's conscious awareness has a very hypnotic effect. Because it has a hypnotic effect, that means it is not resisted and it pretty much goes like clockwork. The good news for you is this, is when you trigger these processes, the exact same processes that she's going to undergo to produce that end result of feeling attracted, when you can trigger them, they're going to happen outside of her conscious awareness and the same powerful effect will take place. So this is very powerful, very cool, really good stuff. And I want to remind you to feel free to pass this module around. Remember, don't change any of the content, don't add anything. Don't subtract anything, and we'll see you in some subsequent modules.